Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us in the last webinar for the school year. It's been a fantastic year. We've had so many amazing speakers come to speak, to talk with the students and share their expertise in different professions. Today we have with us Dr. Josh. Yes, doctor as in PhD, it's not easy. Dr. Josh Bamfo, who is the partner and head of the transfer pricing TP services practice at Anderson in Nigeria, as well as the global co-leader for TP with responsibilities for Africa and Middle East. He has over 14 years of experience specializing in TP, that's transfer pricing, while working for big four firms in the US, South Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana. His areas of expertise are in global and regional TP documentation for multinational companies, TP planning, intellectual property, that's IP planning and transfers, cost contribution arrangements and advanced pricing agreements. He has worked on a number of TP engagements in various industries, including oil and gas, consumer and industrial markets, financial services and telecommunication and technology. He has also worked extensively with the Nigerian tax authorities in developing their TP capabilities and designing TP manuals. Josh was previously a visiting assistant professor of economics at the University of Delaware, US, prior to starting his career in TP with EY in Atlanta, Georgia in June 2007. Prior to joining Anderson, he was an associate director at KPMG in Nigeria. Josh is an ardent speaker at various TP workshops and seminars, including the BNA's Council for International Tax Education TP seminar in Atlanta, where he won the 2009 Top Star Speaker Award. He has also authored and co-authored over 10 TP articles in globally recognized tax journals. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bamfo. We're really excited to have you with us today. And we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say about economics. Thank you very much, um, Ekanta, for having me. And I'm really privileged um, to have this honor of sharing my experience and knowledge in this very interesting discipline of economics. I have to also thank my friend and neighbor, Dr. Wilson, for making this um, possible. Uh, <clears throat> so in the next few minutes, what I'm gonna try to do is try to explain what economics is as a discipline, then um, also look at some of the potential career opportunities in this area and what it offers for the next generation. Um, I'll share my personal experience briefly and um, I'll leave it to Ekanta if there are any other questions that um, I will need to address, then hopefully we'll wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not gonna, hopefully I'm not gonna take too much of your time. Okay, let me put this in, um, <clears throat> okay, good. Okay. So we'll start by trying to understand what the discipline is all about, what is economics? And to put it in context, um, just so that um, this is not um, cut and dry, um, when I started, you know, when I was growing up, you know, my parents, as usual, you know, wanted me to do one of the traditional um, courses or careers, which is medicine. Um, so that was what was, um, I was indoctrinated to believe that, hey, you have to become a medical doctor. So because of that, I went to a high school that specialized in sciences. Um, <clears throat> and um, I started my career reading sciences. And then later on, I realized I was an all-rounder uh, and not very great in the science subjects. So over time, I had to switch. And when I switched, I switched to economics, which is a social science. And um, my dad asked me a simple question, what are you going to be you know, in future when you read economics? I had no clue then. Hopefully, what we'll try to demystify you know, in today's um, presentation is to have an idea what economics is as a discipline why we think it's important or even cool, then I will look at the career opportunities um, that one can have if you um, study economics. So let's start with a simple definition that you can easily Google, all right? So the definition of economics is, says it's a social science, and that's a very important distinction 
It's not a natural science like the biology, chemistry, physics, where you study nature and you can actually do that study in a controlled environment, such as um, a lab where you do experimental research to understand how you know, these um, things really interact. But when you deal with social science, you cannot create an artificial lab to really understand how humans interact with each other. So you really need to study um, people, human beings in real time, all right? So economics is a social science that studies how people interact with value, right? So the key thing here is how do we interact as people in order to create value? And that is the most important thing. And if you think about the fact that we are looking at value creation and everybody would want to create value so that it can be remunerated or compensated for, that makes economics you know, very interesting because it's applicable and relevant to everybody because everybody wants to be in a position where you are creating value and being compensated for it in goods and services and increase your welfare. So it makes you know, economics you know, a cornerstone when it comes to various disciplines in terms of everyday life. But what are, what are the kind of interactions we typically look at? One is you know, production. So which um, sector of the economy is responsible for producing goods and services, all right? You want to understand that and the factors that really impact production of goods and services. We also need to think about once you've produced those goods and services, how do you make that available to the consumers or those who will buy? So that's the distribution, right? How do you distribute these goods and services to the consumers? Then the third leg, obviously, is consumptions. Those who actually purchase these goods and services for their personal consumption. All right. So in a nutshell, that's what economics look, um, um, looks at. And it's very interesting because every time everybody's thinking about the kind of goods and services you can produce or provide, which is going to be vulnerable to somebody that that person is willing to pay for those goods and services, which then becomes an income to you, which allows you to also buy other goods and services to increase your welfare or your satisfaction or standard of living. All right. So that is in, that in a nutshell is what economics is about. All right. So a second definition would be economy. It focuses on behavior interactions of economic agents and how the economies work. All right. So. With that at the back of your mind, I think what you can take from this is, this has to be interesting, all right? Um, when I used to be in academia and used to lecture, what I used to tell my student is, economics is um, a formalized common sense, right? Because we deal with it every day. Even if you've not gone to school to read formal economics, you know, day-to-day -day interactions, you'll be applying concepts of economics every day. So for example, there's this um, concept called the law of demand, and it says, when the prices of goods and services go up, all other factors remain the same, people are gonna demand less of that particular product or, um, or service. And this is common sense, right? If prices are going up, less and lesser people are gonna be able to afford given their income levels, right? So it's common sense, but it's been formalized and we call it a lot, the law of demand, you understand me? So if you think of economics, I think it's a very exciting area, it's basically formalizing our day-to-day -day interactions that creates value and how we determine prices in order for those um, interactions to occur, all right? So for the young folks, what I want to try to convince you is that this is a discipline that is exciting. It's everyday, um, you know, it has applicability for everyday um, things that we do in life, whether we are buying goods, whether you are playing um, your, you know, video games. The question is, okay, it's giving you some satisfaction, which we call utility. However, what is the opportunity cost of that time that you are spending just playing games? What else could you have done which is more valuable? Economics is all about prioritization, all right? And you can use it in everyday um, situation. Um, my children can allude to the fact that anytime I'm talking, I talk a little bit of economics, you know? Anytime they are playing too much, I say, hey, what's the opportunity cost of your time playing for two hours video games? Is the extra one hour you could have used to study and done better in your exams? and put yourself in a better position to go to the best schools out there. So you realize that economics is basically our everyday dealings, okay? So with that, hopefully I've been able to convince um, people that this is an exciting area. I don't have all the time in the world to actually <laughs> try to convince you, but hopefully I've done that. Um, the truth of the matter is I couldn't um, convince my first son. So I don't know how good I am in terms of convincing people about how exciting this area is. Okay. so. 
Now let's move on to the key question because this is a career um, webinar, right? So why should I major in economics whilst in the university? And why should I have a career in economics, all right? What is exciting about it? First is to look at whether you're gonna be passionate about this discipline, all right? Usually those who, um, who tend to be passionate about economics as a discipline for you to major in, in the university and also have a career in are people who tend to like numbers, and people who are curious about how markets work, all right? So first and foremost, um, why should you like numbers? The truth of the matter is economics creates a platform for you to be able to understand, you know, how different markets work, all right? And to do that, we use models. And models could come in the form of graphs, it could come in the form of algebraic equations, and what have you. The higher you go in your in the, um, in the education of economics, the more mathematical it becomes. So if you're familiar with numbers, it helps. First degree, you might not see a lot of numbers with the exception of a particular discipline called econometrics. But as you go further up, even the microeconomics, macroeconomics becomes more mathematical. So um, if you like numbers, then this could be a good fit for you as a career choice, all right? Secondly, if you really want to understand how markets work, and there are different types of markets, all right? You know, there's a market for goods and services. There's the e-commerce today, where a market where we can buy and sell stuff, you know, digitally. You know, there's a market for labor, you know, where we have employers and employees, you know, and the price of that is the wages or salaries they pay them. There's a market for almost everything that there's a transaction between a willing seller and willing buyer at some price. And if you want to understand how those dynamics do work, then you want to have some um, understanding or uh, appreciation for economics. Secondly, if you're um, interested in researching the economy, if you want to understand how factors impact um, concepts like inflation, GDP, devaluation, you know, all these things that I hear on the news, that sound cool, you know, if you want to have an idea of how they work and impact the economy, then you might want to take a career or major in economics, all right? Um, this, this second is true for me. I, um, I was interested in um, economics because I really cared about the factors that impact an economy as a whole. So I'm more of a macroeconomist than a microeconomist that focuses on a particular industry, a particular firm, a particular sector, and so on and so forth. But some look at the big picture, what are the big issues that impact the Nigerian economy, for example. If you want to do research on that, then there's an area you can look at. This is already telling you that, look, with economics, you could either be in the private sector working for firms, or you could actually work in the public sector working for the government or government agencies in different capacities. All right. The fear of major economics is the fact that do you want the flexibility that economics provides? You know, because economics is so broad a discipline that it specialized areas cut across different industries, all right? That when you do economics, you, get, um, you create a platform that gives you a lot of choices in terms of where you really want to build a career in. Um, later on, I'm gonna answer this question. There's nothing like a certification to become an economist, like the way there's a certification to become a chartered accountant, or you have to go to law school to become a lawyer, all right? There's nothing like that. So really, we don't have a professional certification course to become an economist. You know, economics is so broad-based and applies to a lot of different disciplines that, you know, whether you're gonna do law, you're gonna do um, accounting, there's some economics courses that you have to take. If you go to business school, you're gonna take economics courses. So it cuts across different disciplines, all right? And that's the reason why it's so cool. It creates that flexibility for you to then make a decision. But I do, do I want to go into the insurance space? Where, for, for example, if I'm very strong in economics and statistics, I could be an actuarial analyst. Do I want to go into the banking space where you know, I can do a bit of financial economics or finance manager or what have you? Do I want to go into the public sector, such as the Central Bank of Nigeria, where I want to be you know, an economic researcher to help with policy decisions? You know, that's public finance. No, do I want to go into um, labor? All right, where I'm a labor economist and I understand the dynamics of labor and all this kind of stuff, what determines wages, compensation, salaries, and all those kind of stuff. You know, there's a, a specialized area in economics for that called labor economics. So if you think about it, you know, economics creates a platform for you to be able to move into different areas. You know, you could even study the stock market and become a player, you know, in that particular space. 
if you want to deal with hedge funds and all this kind of stuff. So if you want the flexibility, you know, then you want to have um, uh, major in economics. Unlike other um, areas where, for example, if you do accounting, most likely you are get towards, you know, a career in accounting as an auditor or what have you, okay? So these are some of the factors you need to take into consideration if you want to have a major in economics in the university and have a career in economics, right? You know, an appreciation for numbers, curiosity about how markets work, you know, if you want to make the economy better and we be able to understand the issues that impact the economy, then you want to have a, a major in it. And if you want to have the flexibility that you might want to have a major in economics in the university and a career in economics. All right. So what careers are available with a degree in economics? So when I say degree, I'm going to the basics, first, uh, first degree, bachelor's, all right? But the good thing is with economics, you can do your master's and still have that flexibility and can even do your PhD, which I did, which makes you more specialized and still have some options, right? So this is for basic first degree. As I said, it creates a platform for you uh, for you to be able to move into different areas. So some of the options available to you after you've done your first degree in economics would be, for example, a financial investment analyst, right? So you're gonna be in the financial service industry where because of your um, economics allows you to become analytical and financial investment analysts are basically, you know, analysis you perform in those sector. So it gives you those tools and skills to then be able to specialize in this particular area. Obviously, if you're gonna be a financial analyst, you might have to take the chartered financial analyst course, CFA, all right? But the economics would have given you that base before you then certify to become a financial analyst per se. So it creates that platform for you to move into that direction if that's where your interest lies. You could also move into where the space I am, where you move to the um, professional services industry, you know, the big four firms, you know, and, and, and the likes, where you can become an auditor, you know, or you can become a tax consultant, or you can become a transfer pricing analyst, which is my area of specialization. Transfer pricing data, when I can talk about it, is a specialized area in taxation, which deals with international tax, and we typically support multinational enterprises comply with regulations to ensure that uh, profits are not shifted from one jurisdiction to the other, and therefore the government then tries to protect their tax base. But we can talk about the details later. You can also become an economic consultant, right? And you can join think tank firms where they do economic research, either for businesses, for governments, and what have you. Um, you can be a financial planner or manager with a bank. Uh, you can be an actual, actual analyst with an insurance company where you analyze the risk, you know, implications of some of the uh, insurance packages. Uh, you can be a data analyst today. Um, we're in the world of big data, right? Almost every business wants to have a lot of data about those who consume their product or service. And they want people to be able to analyze those, those data to identify trends so that they can really strategize in terms of how best to maximize the returns they get from their consumers and also provide quality services or products. So data analysts are in high demand today. Once again, when you do economics, because it's social science, that's, they, you, you are taught how to do research and how to interpret data. So it gives you that skill set for you to then specialize as a data analyst, all right? Or you could go to the public sector. As I said, you could go to the um, Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, as one example, it could be, uh, be in other departments, labor, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, what have you. That's a lot of areas in the public sector where your skills set in economics is very relevant. Or you could actually um, go to one of my dreams, which I um, did not come true, was to work with international financial institutions like the IMF World Bank, Africa Development Bank. You know, they all deal with economies, you know, and so if you have an economics as a background, you become a good candidate for these, um, you know, um, institutions. All right. <clears throat> so what are the types of firms, you know, I've talked about the areas, so what kind of companies I, are you likely to end up with if you were to read um, economics? Clearly, you could either be in the public sector or the private sector. So the first um, one would be my type of firm, professional service firms. Um, my firm is Anderson. Anderson is a revival of Art Anderson, which used to be the number one brand, you know, uh, until its implosion in 2002. Uh, it's been revived and the, uh, <clears throat> it's headquartered in San Francisco. Today, we're in 130 countries. 
but we are no longer doing audit. So we do both tax um, consulting and business advisory. You could end up with KPMG or the, the big force, KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, and EY. These are you know, the big four professional service firms. People sometimes call them accounting firms, but they don't do only accounting. They do business advisory, they do tax consulting, and they do um, audit work, all right? So, and the good thing is with economics, you could actually be in any of the three areas, right? Economists could become tax consultants. I'm an economist, I have a PhD in economics, and I'm highly specialized in a specialized area in taxation cost and surprises. You know, I'm not a chartered accountant, but I'm working with, you know, this professional service. I've worked with three of these professional service firms, all right? So, or you could actually be in the audit space, in which case, once you go there, you need to then charter to become an ICANN chartered, you know, accountant, or you can do ACCA or what have you and become an auditor, all right? Or you could actually be in the business advisory, which is the business consulting space with your economist background. But over time, depending on which area, you might have to either get a certification in um, a CFA or what have you, which is relevant. But there are um, a host of opportunities with working for any of these big four firms and the non-big four firms in the professional service space if we're to have a first degree in economics. All right, or you could end up in the banks. And if you're in Nigeria, you know some of the um, you know, usual suspects, GT Bank, Zen Bank, UBA, Access Bank, First Bank. These are big, you know, um, Nigerian headquartered multinational banks. You know, they have presence in multiple African jurisdictions and you could actually be a major player in the banks. You could also join insurance companies, you know, either in the capacity of an actuarial, you know, analyst, as I talked about, that would require that you are very strong in statistics, you know, as well as economics, right? Or you could be in the public and civil services sector, the usual suspect um, CBN, which is the Central Bank of Nigeria, is one um, you know, government agency that has a lot of economists because you know, they basically are responsible for the management of the economy through monetary policy. So um, basically, uh, most of them are economists. Okay? It could be with the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics where you do research and give us um, data in terms of the performance of various sectors of the economy. You could be in the Ministry of Finance, for example. You know, you could be in a, a, a ministry which deals with labor and what have you. So there are a lot of options in the public and civil service sector if that's where your interest lies. As I said, international financial institutions is one of the big plays um, because you know, during our period growing up, you know, you go to school, then you do uh, what we call national service. I'm Ghanaian. I had to do two national service, but most of these programs that they, we have at the IMF or about African Development Bank have some management training programs that have um, an age limit, you know, so that by the time you are applying, you need to make sure that you're not uh, close to meeting or exceeding that age limit. My, in my case, what happened was, you know, I got an um, invitation to interview for, you know, these programs where the IMF um, went over to DC went through various levels of interviews to the very final stage where we're screened to about only eight. And these are global folks, you know, but my dissertation had not advanced well enough and it's going to come the next year, but by that next year, I'd missed the age limit. I'd gone above. So what I would say is today, people, the younger folks, um, by the time they go to university, they are much younger. So you can apply to these international financial institutions way earlier so that if you don't get it the first shot, you might have multiple uh, opportunities before you get to your age limit. But this is a plethora of you know, opportunities right, um, that um, exist once you have economics degree. Um, or you could stay in academia. Um, this one area I started my career in, I did a lot of research, a lot of teaching, you know, through my postgraduate program, you know, my master's program in, at the um, Investor of Gulf in Canada, you know, I was both an instructor and a research assistant. By the time I did my PhD, I was a full-time instructor and a research assistant. And I became a visiting assistant professor before I made a decision to go to corporate America and join EY in the US. So these are all opportunities you have at your disposal. Whether you have a first degree, you have a master's, or even have a PhD, you know, all these opportunities do exist. They are not exhaustive, you know, 
So one of the things they still told me to touch on would be the, some of the average salary for economists, all right? You know, usually these are average, you know, entry salaries. Uh, my research focus on the US market for the most part. So this is a USD, all right? Um, obviously it will differ whether you are looking at it from a Nigerian perspective. I couldn't get enough information on the Nigerian market. But if you were to become a financial risk analyst, all right, on the average, you know, uh, entry level is around almost 62,000 USD, which given today's um, exchange rate, if you use 400 in Naira to a dollar as your exchange rate, you know, then that's around 24 million Naira a year, thereabout, all right. And that's entry level, you know, for a first degree person, this is pretty good, all right. So I've included some information as to, you know, what financial risk anal an analyst does, all right. You know, you, risk is very important to businesses, all right. So if you have people who can analyze the risk, you know, um, that a, a business um, is potentially going to face, and they can provide mitigation, uh, mitigating understanding. So this is a very um, interesting area. Okay. The second, you know, it could be an auditor. We've already talked about it. And the average entry level around 56,619 in the US. Um, in the US. Um, it could be in the consulting and companies like the big four firms. It could also be in the government. Or it could even be. Uh, with a company, all right, okay. Or it could be an economic institution with this um, Central Bank of Nigeria or private agencies or what we call tic, um, tic tacs, all right. So entry level average is 7,480. Yeah. Uh, it could be a financial manager, typically in the public sector or even with the banks, you know, and pays pretty well, uh, around 62,000. Actual analysts, this was, was pretty popular some years back where most of us economists knew that look, to make good money, our strength in statistics and math has, um, had to be sharper if you wanted to go into the insurance companies and become an actual analyst. You can see that the entry level average um, salary is significantly higher than most of the others that we've looked at, right? It's the highest so far. But um, you need to be strong from a numbers perspective, okay? All right, so those are some of the sal um, average salaries, you know, that um, we can look at. Um, to wrap up and then I'll open it um, up for questions and answers. Let me share my personal story. You know, I like to uh, put things in proper perspective. As I said, um, growing up, my dad wanted me to be a medical doctor um, and I turned out not to be one. Um, my lesson from that is to give my children some flexibility in identifying areas they are passionate about. Um, but also guide them in understanding the prospects that those areas, you know, have for them. Um, interestingly, my wife has done a good job of also indoctrinating them to pursue medicine. I've been, had a laissez fair approach, which means a hands-off approach, but giving them broad guidance. Um, so how did I end up doing economics? Um, after I had failed in my pursuit of becoming a medical doctor, I had to switch from sciences to social sciences. And that was a pretty easy transition. And so social sciences had a major in economics at the University of Ghana. I, I realized that I had to do well, but what I didn't know then was what was I gonna be in the future once I had a first degree in economics. So we didn't have the same opportunity that um, Green Spring is providing to their students and the parents of those students because uh, nobody came to talk to me about any subject, let alone economics, all right? So my dad asked me, what are you gonna be in future? And I was very clueless. Um, so today I would say, look, anytime you start a journey, you need to have the end in mind even before you start. But this was a case whereby I focused on the process, all right? All I knew was if I could get good solid education, major in economics, I was gonna have options. What the options were gonna provide, I had no clue, but I believed in the process. So good, um, good news, I did very well, had a first class in economics, got funding to go do my master's at the University of Canada, um, University of Gulf in Canada, then moved to University of Delaware in the US, you know. And once I was done, 
the options were clearly there. I had options, you know, as I talked to you about, you know, international financial institutions, IMF, if it wasn't for the age limit, I would have worked there. You know, had options in the private corporate America, you know, had options in academia. And uh, I chose to go with corporate America and join Ernst & Young in Atlanta office. Um, it created a lot of opportunities because I had a skill set that was different from a lot of people around me because most of them were accountants. Um, I was able to then make a big decision, all right, to come back to Africa to help with the development of a specialized area in taxation. So I left a very, you know, promising career in the U.S. In five years, I'd already uh, was about to make senior manager, right? So I made senior manager in South Africa. I was there for nine months, wanted to come to West Africa, specifically Nigeria, because I saw it as a, a country with potential in terms of growth. My, my, my mindset then was, yeah, Nigeria was going to be the China of the world. Yeah. Um, so I moved to Nigeria eight years ago, and I've been there ever since. And I've been in a position to be able to impact people, train them in this specialized area. And people are building careers in a new area, you know, called transfer pricing. So uh, that is it. Um, hopefully, um, I've done a little bit of justice, giving you some idea what this discipline is all about. If uh, you have to take anything from this, one of the biggest advantage of actually being an economist is the flexibility it provides a young um, um, person once you graduate to move into different areas that you may be interested in specializing in. Because economics is so broad-based, it's so relevant for a lot of areas that once you have it as a first degree, you could go into finance, you could go into public sector, you know, you could go into banking, you could go into academia, what have you. There are a lot of options available to you once you have that first degree. And that knowledge is always reasonable because um, whether you listen to the news and they're talking about devaluation, inflation, GDP growth rate, you have an idea of what it actually entails and can make meaningful contributions when you're socializing and you kind of sound smart when you have an idea of what the inflation is all about, what the devaluation depreciation is all about. So that's it. Um, I will open it up for any questions um, at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bamfo. Oh, that was um, quite insightful, very insightful, especially for those of us who don't um, do economics. Um, I'm very curious. You said you, you, so you did your undergraduate, your master's, and your PhD in economics. So was your initial plan to go into academia to, to actually teach, or were you just doing it to open up a PhD? Because that, that is a lot of stuff. That is a lot of economics. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. The truth of the matter is, I never had a plan of doing a PhD in economics. It was never in my plan at all. Um, what I knew was I wanted to have a Western education, and I knew that I was going to have that in economics because I realized I was good at it. So, ending up with a first class in my first degree, I knew that I was going to have a master's in economics, but I never had a clue I was going to do PhD. What came as a surprise to me was I finished my master's in, in Canada in a year, and I realized that, okay, what, what, what is next for me? Am I going back to Ghana? Am I staying and getting my papers to work in Canada? What, you know? And so um, PhD became a last resort, you know, just for me to figure out what I really wanted to do in my life. And uh, it turned out to be a good thing because um, even though the higher you go in terms of the degrees, the more specialized you become. Remember I said, yes. um, economics is a platform for you to go into different areas. But as you become more specialized, some of those areas, those opportunities close, right? Because with a PhD, it was going to be very difficult for me to just move into any area of banking or now going to do um, chartered accountant and, and all this kind of stuff. So the higher you go, the more specialized you become, the options narrow. However, if you find your niche, you know, the remuneration is better. So for example, when, when I went to Corporate America, I quite remember I can share this information. If you say entry level uh, um, pay is around 60 something, you know, with my PhD economics, and this was the first time I was working in corporate America, I still remember my first contract, it was 85,000 USD. Within, uh, within, wow. a year, wow. within a year or two, I was earning six figures, right? So um, it turned out to be a good thing, although it narrowed my options. But once I found a niche, all right, I was remunerated, you know, handsomely. 
you know, it's been a source of differentiation for me. Interesting. In the interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So I have two questions based on your and you AP. You said it narrows your options, but does it give you more? Does it um make it easier for you to get into like? international organizations like IMF or World Bank, if you have a PhD in economics, will it make it easier for those kind of institutions? Yeah, definitely, because those institutions need researchers, right? By the time you are done with first degree, you don't really know how to research. You don't know how to do research and come up with forecasts because you wouldn't have done serious econometrics, right? So the higher you go, you become more specialized. So you become, and that's where you become a real economist. A first degree person is not an economist. You just have economics major. Mm -hmm. Even a master's doesn't make you mm -hmm. an economist. We don't have a certification mm -hmm. exam. You only are referred to as an economist typically when you have a PhD, right? You know, so wow. really uh, for you to work with any of these international financial institutions, for you to work with uh, central banks such as CBN, where there's emphasis on research, right? Then PhD gives you the competitive advantage, you know, because a first degree you need to then go and learn how to do proper research, policy implications, and all that. So as you go up, depending on the um, area, it might be an advantage, but it might close some areas. So IMF, World Bank, African Development Bank, central banks, all these policy-oriented you know, type of institutions, PhD clearly is a source of advantage. And I, I quite remember when I was interviewing at IMF, <laughs> there, there was nobody who was interviewing who was below PhD. We all had wow. PhDs, and even with the- Wow. Yeah, so, wow. Uh, Wow. Hmm. I'll get back to the IMF because I'm curious, but I also wanted to find out. So you said you moved, you had your PhD, then you moved to e and EY and you didn't have, so did you not get, did you not get any, now you're working in tax and you're not a chartered accountant. So are you saying you did not need to get any certification because I, I mean, I know even in tax, you need some certification. How did you manage it? Okay. So good question. So typically tax is seen as an accounting area, right? So we are seen as tax accountants. So typically you go to all these professional services for you to be a tax consultant, you need to be chartered, right? Uh, however, this new area for transfer pricing is actually a specialized, it's based on economic principle by transfer price and services. Our economists first and foremost, accountants and lawyers, because it's a highly controversial area. So there's a lot of dispute resolution between the tax authorities and our multinational enterprise clients. So there's a lot of court cases. So because economic area, you need not have a certification in accounting, for example, you don't, don't need to be a chartered accountant, but you need to be a PhD economist so that you don't have to charter, right? So um, I joined the UI with a PhD and I didn't need to charter. I moved to Africa, um, worked with KPMG, worked with PwC, and I didn't need to charter in all, all cases mm. because I'm a PhD person and yeah. my skill set was relevant for that particular area. For that particular area, I see, I see. So let's uh, let's talk about. Um, you said missed opportunity at the IMF, and then you later said you interviewed with the IMF because um, I would like the students to maybe understand that because they might some people might just think, oh, I'm going to apply to IMF and I'm going to get accepted, but you didn't get accepted. So what what do you think went wrong, and what would you have done differently? All right, so. Um, some of these big financial institutions are a hot cake, right? Almost everybody globally wants to work with them. And so you are looking at um, competing with people yes. from Europe, people from US, yes. people from Latin America. And if you, if you you have an idea about schools in the US, um, they are ranked, right? I quite remember during my final interview, there were eight of us. Um, seven or six of them were from Ivy League schools, right? Wow. The other person which wasn't from an Ivy League school was from a very top school, which is um, University of Chicago, all right? Mm -hmm. And Chicago is one of the top most schools when it comes mm -hmm. to economics. In fact, it's top three. It's just that it's not Ivy League because they don't play in the it's Ivy League. It's not yet. But it's one of the top most economic schools. And um, the type of research that they were doing in the Ivy League schools was way at a higher level than 
those of us in the mid-tier schools, University of Delaware is seen as a mid-tier school, right? But my topic was interesting. I was I looking see. at the impact of a trade, a professional trade agreement that US has had extended to Africa. It was called AGWA, Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. So I was doing a simple empirical research to see whether this you know, um, policy has been a success you know, in terms of you know, um, impacting the lives of Africans. So IMF found that topic mm -hmm. interesting, right? You know, so even though yeah. I wasn't coming from an, a top school per se, I made it to that final stage because of the interest they had in my topic, which had to do with Africa, all right? Now, where they became disappointed was they had a lot of questions about the findings of my research, right? But unfortunately, I not got into the state whereby I was, you know, I had findings, I had thoughts, I had hypotheses, mm -hmm. but I not tested mm -hmm. them. So you could see but disappointment in their face. Mm -hmm. They wanted the results. They wanted to hear from me, what uh, was this a success or not? And that would have created a good opportunity for me. So my, my, uh, my lesson was one, you know, you want to go to these interviews where you've done a lot of work in terms of your research work that you can actually say, this is the work I've done. This was the results I came up with. But those are the, some of the things they are looking out for. Secondly, I was kind of too old by the time I applied, right? So for the younger folks, um, good thing is they are going to school and um, university much earlier than we did, mm. you understand? So they'll be much younger and below the age limit. And secondly, they should learn that by the time you go for search, all right, you should have done some paper or research that they will find interesting. So that when they're asking questions, because they are looking at your research ability, right? So if you don't have results, how do we really yes. guess whether this yes. is going to be how a good How do we research know that you are? So that was a yes. For me. Wow, interesting. Interesting. Wow, like that's be so. I mean, basically, you need to be really qualified. What I get from this is you need to be really qualified, but you also be, need to be prepared. Your research needs to be sound, and then you need to be in a certain yep. age group. So you can't you can't just yep. delay and say, okay, I'm going to do my master's now and do my PhD in five years or six years, because they are also looking at an age bracket to, for people yeah. they want to employ. Definitely. Wow. Definitely. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. Um, so please let me just take you back because you said you moved okay. from sciences to the social sciences. So was this when you were in secondary school and did you take economics as a subject when you were in secondary school or did you not take it? And then when you went to university, you decided to take it. How did it work? Okay. So back in the day, we had what we call you know, the O levels or ordinary level uh, exam in the advanced level, right? So first five years, I, um, you know, O level, I was a pure full science student, you know, and I realized that I did way better in my non-science and the basic, you know, core courses. I was very good in math, but I had challenges with ad math, for example, <laughs> right? So I was kind of confused. Am I really good or not? So it's not like it wasn't good, but be, I, I was a bit mediocre when it came to sciences. So I told my dad, hey, if I didn't end up with a distinction, all right, at the time, I had a very good score, but I didn't get a distinction. Why don't I go to an area where I can really excel? So I shifted to math, geography, economics when I was doing my advanced, um, you know, level like, um, exam. Economics, and that was the first time I was taking economics, sixth form, all right? That was the first time I was taking economics. From, one, from year one to year five, I had I not, I not taken economics before. So that was the first time I was taking economics. Wow. Then, um, wow. I, I, then I went to the wow. university and I did a major in economics. Now, what came to help me was that I did sciences. I did math and ad math. So what happens is that the higher you go in economics, the more mathematical it becomes. But, so luckily, because I did sciences and I did math and ad math, they, it came to help me because if not, I would have struggled in a subject called econometrics, which is highly mathematical and it has a lot of statistics. So mm -hmm. my sciences actually came to help me in the long run, you know, even though I was complaining you know, initially. So I thank my dad that he forced me to do science in the first place because um, as I went <laughs> higher, I was dealing with calculus and all those stuff, you know, because of my, my science background, I was able to survive and do it. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, it's interesting, like even for my profession, so it's good to know because I mean, it's good to know that students should be good in math 
and yeah. add math, hopefully, if they want yeah. to be successful economists. So it's not enough to just go to economics class and cram. You need to be good in math yeah. too. You need to like numbers. Um, yes. So you were talking about firms that people can work in, but um, mm -hmm. you didn't mention, you know, there's the big four in professional services and there's the, then there's yes. the big three in consulting. That's McKinsey, Bain, yeah. and then um, BCG. So can economists work yeah. in those companies too, or? De definitely, um, sorry for missing them out, right? Definitely, because one thing about economics is this, if you have a first degree in economics, right? It's a platform for you to then specialize in different areas. So for example, if you were to go to the McKinsey's of the world, and you're gonna be in a sector where you are doing, let's say financial modeling or what, what have you, then you definitely need to have your CFA, you know? So economics is just the base because um, when you are doing first degree, you wouldn't be a chartered financial analyst, for example. But depending on um, which area you want to specialize in and how they want to use you, you might then have to then have that certification in that particular area. So economics is a base that can move you into different areas. Obviously, um, the those big consulting firms tend to have from um, some, um, you know, depending on where you are, if you're in the US, you know, if you're in the more ranked university, the higher your probability of being able to work with such firms like McKinsey's and, you know, luckily we do have McKinsey in Nigeria. So if you went, you know, yes. you had good grades, yes. then yeah, you could, you could actually end up working in McKinsey. Um, we used to yeah. share the same building with them at Heritage yeah. Towers before we moved. Okay. So I, I know a couple of guys, a couple of Ghanaian, you know, who also had a background in economics who works there, so. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm also curious, speaking about careers and um, sectors, I'm curious about the public sector, because you mentioned CBN a lot, but how, how should I say lucrative? How lucrative is it to work in the public sector as an economist, especially like in a country like that? So I, I use CBN a lot because CBN Basically, it's all about research and uh, policy formulation and policy implementation. So um, everywhere you, we've gone, whether in the US or Ghana, you know, it's been an area where most economists target, right? Now, um, it's, a, it, it's, not, it's a government agency that is very important. So I believe that um, their salaries are pretty competitive. But what is more important is uh, if you're somebody who lost politics, all right, there's a very um, a, a simple overlap between policy making and going to politics and you know being part of policy formulation and execution, for example, right? So um, it's always been an outlet. You, you, you can see a number of CBN governors, especially the economists, who then later on try to move into politics. The Soludos of the world, you know. Uh, yes. Yeah, Sanusi's of the world could have easily, if he had not gone into um, becoming, you know, uh, <laughs> a traditional, the MF, yeah. he could have maybe, yeah. exactly. But you, the trend you see is that all of them are economists when they become governors, all right? There's a clear linkage between that and, you know, politics and making a big difference because it's all about policy and kind of monetary policies to have an impact on the economy and people tend to, you know, easily make that transition. I know that um, I, for one, although I've been focused in tax consulting, in Ghana, I have presentations on the economy. I make presentations to NECA, which is um, you know, a body of employers, where I make um, quarterly presentations on the um, data that comes from National um, Nigeria Bureau of Labor Stat um, of Statistics on the economy. So really, it's a simple transition to politics and leadership if you find that interesting. So most economists tend to look at central banks, you know, and CBN, you know, I think it's a strong one. Okay. Yeah. And because okay. you need to have a PhD, you, okay. you can easily differentiate okay. yourself. If you yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I was looking at the salaries for the, the different salaries for different um, professions related there. Most of them are US dollars. Are we like if realistically, if we're working in a country like Nigeria, can we can anybody that is an economist expect to let me not say anybody that's economy, but maybe at entry level or mid management level, can they expect to make that kind of money? Because if you convert $61,000 to Naira, 
I don't even know how many millions it is, but it's a lot of money. Uh, yeah. exactly. So if since we're in Nigeria, realistically, can they expect to make that amount of money in, okay. at any stage in their career as an economist? De de definitely. The, the problem we have is the rate at which the Naira has been depreciating against the dollar, right? When I came to Nigeria, a dollar was, I said, 165 Naira or something like that. Right. Today, yeah. it's north of 400. So it's like threefold or quadrupled, you know. And so um, a local employer doesn't care about the ex exchange rate, right? They are going to pay you Naira. So rather, they care about inflation rates. That is whether they are increasing your salary compared to the way average prices are going up, because that will determine whether you are worse off or not. But if an expatriate or you have expenses outside of Nigeria, then you have to convert that Naira to dollars. That's where it hurts you. You understand me? So if you do the direct conversion, all right, then today uh, you realize that it might be difficult for a, a, an entry level person to be making 61,000 USD because it means a lot in terms of Naira. It's about yeah. 20 plus million yeah. Yeah. Is it Naira. Now, yeah. at your firm, you need yeah. to be mid management level to be making that kind of money. You know, either you know, a manager to, you know, um, to senior manager start making that kind of money. All right. But that same 60 something thousand dollars. A few years ago, when the exchange rate was, let's say, a dollar to 200 and something or 300, all right, would have meant a lower amount of Naira, maybe 15 million, and maybe that would have been achievable. You understand me? So what has happened is the number has ballooned because of the depreciation of the Naira against the dollar, all right? You know, so, yeah. so a few years, it could have been achieved. Yeah. But now, but what I would say is that with the international firm, much you against you know what they are paying others in other jurisdictions obviously adjusted for you know uh, <clears throat> you know your cost of living all right yeah so in those firms you can mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. say that they can easily make such you know and, and you know have amount of money so it depends on the type of firm you do go to if you were to get McKinsey or you know those are international firms and they have standards right yeah. across board so yes. yeah so you, you could get that but there are few and in between. There are few, <laughs> yeah. yeah, because I don't think everybody can work in the USA. Um, and then speaking of that, so you, yeah. you mentioned that you moved to Nigeria because you saw potential for economic growth, and that was eight years ago. So what, I mean, now, yeah. what do you, what, what do you think about Nigeria's potential for economic growth? compared to eight years ago, because we, we have to, we have to keep it real. <laughs> All right. So eight years ago, um, oil was major. Oil prices were high. Nigeria was still producing, um, you know, a lot of oil per day. So really that was spurring the economy on. Nigeria was growing on the average around 6%. Um, there were a lot of foreign direct investment businesses were coming down. Um, you know, Nigeria was in the same group like, you know, the BRICS, you know, Brazil, you know, um, the other big economies that were growing. Um, but with that success, uh, we became a bit lazy in terms of thinking outside the box, in terms of um, um, diversifying the economy a little bit. And it's, it's natural when you have a source of success, uh, nobody, uh, you see, if something is not broken, you don't fix it, all right? So we became highly dependent on it until there was an oil price shock and in 2007, you know, we, we all know um, what has happened in um, recent times of 2017 or 2016. You know, now we know that the oil prices are not gonna be the same, even though they've come up to almost $70 per barrel, $60 per barrel, but it's never gonna be the same. Mm -hmm. We all know that um, mm -hmm. Biden, Joe Biden's administration is high on, you know, um, clean energy, you know, they are making huge investments in that, um, you know, sector. Other countries are going to catch on Europe. So demand for crude oil will never be the same as before. So we yeah. need to keep it real, as you said. So what yeah. governments have said is that we're going to diversify the economy, we're going to diversify the economy. But there's a lot of lip service than the actual action. There have been few, um, you know, policies towards um, agriculture and agro-allied um, and businesses. But, you know, the economy has really struggled. Uh, um, struggled. There's scarcity of Forex, so you cannot really buy plant and equipment to make investments. Our energy sector power is a big problem. 
you know. So really, there's challenges, all right? But the fact that there are challenges doesn't mean that the potential has gone away. Nigeria, by virtue of its size, all right, and the fact that that, that size in terms of the population, the people are also a significant number of them are well educated. The side that we might have cheap labor creates an opportunity for businesses to come in and take advantage of the size, which is demand, and cheap labor, which helps with cost, all right? But we need to fix energy. We need to fix our infrastructure deficit in terms of transportation, you know, uh, the ports, you know, how long it takes for you to actually take your stuff out of the ports to even take it to the warehouse. All these things that makes the process efficient and make people and businesses productive has to be done. And once those things are done, Nigeria definitely has the potential to be clearly not just number one, you know, but the country that everybody would want to be a part of. So the potential still exists, but we need leaders who are very committed to making the things that they say. Everybody can talk about policy, but it's execution, you know. So clearly the potential still exists, but for now we are struggling. Thank you. It's good to know that, you know, there is still potential in Nigeria. It's good to know that because, I mean, the news, a lot of things are quite discouraging. And like you said, the price of crude oil, the dependence on crude oil in most of the world is de is reducing. So, I mean, it's encouraging. Thank you for that. So, um, but what if people, what if like our students, they don't want to work in Nigeria? Which other countries can you recommend with, you know, good potential for economic growth? Maybe other countries in Africa. Which other countries can you recommend? Like, what would what would you say in the next five to ten years? Where would be the best countries to work in as economists? So, really, one of the, the major big changes is going to be the Africa Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. You know, Africa allows for you know mobility of people, uh, mobility of goods and services across Africa as a continent. You know, so really. Um, somebody could be here and be providing services in Ghana and wouldn't be much of a problem and so on and so forth. So there's going to be mobility of people. Um, Nigerian um, experts could go to Ghana by, and, visa, and you know, vice versa. So um, clearly in terms of potential, right, uh, there are a few countries that have shown some you know, high growth before um, the COVID pandemic. So Rwanda is one, Cote d'Ivoire is another, Ethiopia has consistently grown at a very high rate. If you look at the aviation industry, it's one of the very best you can talk about. Um, Ghana, under the current government, started very well. Um, the pandemic, we see how they bounce back. Um, so there are a number of countries that have shown um, you know, short-term potential. I think, you know, and I say this consistently, the variables are just too many in Africa because one leader can make significant change you know, in an economy only for we don't really tend to have good succession plan and another leader can come and move it in another direction. You know, that is typically not the case in the most advanced economies. Um, if, you are, if you take US, it was never, you don't see significant swings, whether it's a Republican government or Democratic government, all right? There are different um, demeanors, but usually the policies are pretty much set, you know, there's a lot of volatility. But here in Africa, a change in leadership can swing it one way or the other. You know, we saw it in South Africa under Zuma. You know, we've seen it in other jurisdictions. You know, so um, clearly there's going to be potential um, with African um, continental free trade agreement. People can move outside of um, Nigeria and still work elsewhere. Uh, I, I still think Ghana will be a good um, place because it's an anglophone country, so we don't have um, in, um, language challenges. Cote d'Ivoire might be a bit challenging because it's francophone. Uh, Kenya is great on the east side because um, you know they also have, especially at the IT world, all right, fintech, which um, young guys in Africa, um, in, in Nigeria, are doing well in Kenya is also another area. So there are opportunities to move around a little bit. You understand me? So um, we need to be, stay positive, and I think that with this um, free trade agreement amongst African countries, that mobility becomes a reality. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you. So at least the students have um, opportunities in other countries. So they're not limited to Nigeria and because most of them in America where there's probably a, a high supply of economy. So they actually branches in Africa. Yeah. So um, you, you think 
you speak very well. You're very eloquent. I was wondering if, and I don't know, do you develop these skills along the way? But you, besides math, you said you need math and add math to be an economist. But what are non-academic skills? What do you need to develop them along the way? Because these have to be critical. All right. Th thank you very much. Obviously, um, you know, being eloquent in um, a language that is the main uh, medium of communication is very critical, all right? You can be the best analyst, um, but if you want to be, a, for example, a good consultant, you need to be able to be able to express and explain, you know, your models or your results, all right? Or else you always be in the background. You know, the nature, the na some of the nature of the jobs aside that you have to interact with clients, customers, or what have you, and your ability to actually articulate, you know, whatever advice you want to give a client is very important. So for me, what has been helpful has been my ability to explain what's seemingly complex. And I think I built that in the academic world where I was a lecturer or instructor for years, you know, so I have the ability to stand in front of people and talk. And that has been a source of differentiation in the consulting world. Um, so that is a good skill. In addition to being analytical, um, obviously the other skill sets, being a people person, um, you know, how to build your network. I always tell young folks that when you go to school, there are two things that are very important, right? One is to acquire knowledge. And the second is to build a long lasting, strong network, you know, because those two are going to make, make a lot of difference as you go ahead in your career. You always need to be, build a very strong network of people that you can fall on. Uh, you also need to acquire the, the knowledge. So your ability to build a, in a strong network is also very important in terms of your success. Yeah, so those are some of the things that I think will be very important because as has been said today, it's not your technical knowledge that makes you a success you need to be emotionally intelligent. And being emotionally intelligent is all about self-awareness, being, you know, being uh, aware of people's social um, um, issues, and being able to build a strong network of people. You know? So the focus should always be on emotional intelligence more than intellectual you know, um, knowledge, just your IQ. You know, yeah, has become equally important. So for me, the ability to communicate, the ability to articulate, uh, the ability to build relationships that are lasting, you know, um, be able to engage and the ability to develop others, work as a team. You know, it's all about interactions. You know, if you have those skill sets, then you're going to be successful, especially in the business world. Um, if not, then maybe um, you get limited to academia, you know, where you do your research and uh, you get your publication. Um, but in the business world, you're going to deal with people internally and externally. Thank you for thank you for that, sir. So yeah, it's good to know that they need to develop um other skills. So what about um sorry, I don't know, I stepped out a bit. What about um technology? Yeah, so technology is very important. Um we are in a world where everything is being digitalized, you know. So um having knowledge of technology and how they are impacting your business is going to be critical. We all know of artificial intelligence taking away some jobs. Some jobs are becoming obsolete, you understand me? So clearly you need to understand whether, how you know, technological advancement is impacting your sector or your business. The good thing is, you know, no matter what um, um, artificial intelligence can do in terms of routine stuff, right? Uh, when it comes to interpretation of results and articulating it such a way that it makes sense, um, still human beings are gonna play a role everything is not going to be overly digitalized. So you need to understand what is going on. And the good news is, if I look at the next generation, Generation Z folks, um, they really love, you know, technology stuff. You know, all their games are technology-based. You know, my kid will be sitting down and playing with people elsewhere, and I'm wondering, who are you talking to? You know, our time, we go and play football outside, right, where we interact. But these people are, you know, they already are comfortable with, you know, um, technology and stuff like that so it's going to be very important so really they need to be abreast with advancements in technology because it's always going to augment you know uh, in some cases just augment it might not replace your work right 
but you need to know how to it augment your work and make you more efficient, more productive, so you can take advantage of it. I, I, I always say we shouldn't look at technology as a, a competitor <laughs> in the labor space. We just should see it as uh, a means of complementing our work so that we become more productive and we can do more in better times. You know, so we just have a responsibility of getting to know what is going on and how does it help me become more efficient on a job. You know, rather than seeing it as a way um, a rival that could take my work away. Wow, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, so um, so I think from everything we've gathered from this um, discussion, economics is still going to be very relevant in the future because there are so many areas that you can work in. So what, um, what advice can you give to, what is the, like if you, were, if you could give one single advice to young students who want to be economists, what would you advise them to do? All right, so my, my advice to the young generation is first and foremost, you need to identify something that you are passionate about because passion is the fuel that always is going to move the engine forward. So if you are passionate about, you know, numbers, you know, economies, you know, markets, how they operate, and you want to have the flexibility to then determine which of the areas I want to specialize in, whether to go into the insurance space as an actual scientist, go to the banking space as a finance um, analyst or manager, to go to public sector such as the CBN, to be a researcher, to go to international financial institutions such as IMF, all these things, all right? But I need to be first and foremost passionate about this area that I will choose to focus in. Once you are passionate about it, then you need to then pull that uh, passion into real execution of a plan. You know, what type of um, degree do I need to have? What kind of schools do I want to go so that it enhances my probability of working for the best firms? Mm -hmm. You know, so whether I'm going to school in Nigeria, I'm going to the West, what type of schools, top schools, um, what kind of grades do I need to make in order to enter into those top schools? All the decisions we make today are going to have implications in the future, right? So we need to have a clear plan in terms of, you know, how we execute our plan so that the probability of success in this chosen field becomes high, uh, yeah. all right? Yeah. There's no guarantee. I keep telling my children, look, um, there's no guarantee that when you go to school, to the top school is gonna be highly successful. But if there's a particular path, there are multiple paths to success. The one that is guaranteed, um, that has shown a lot of success repeatedly has always been education. Education has made people who came from relatively poor families become you know, relevant. You can look at the Obama story, all right? It's all about education. You know, he started at some point went to a community college. Once he went to Harvard, you know, then he was in a different class of his own, right? Then that made and created a path yeah. to um, presidency. So we need to always have the end in mind and start making choices that would enhance our probabilities of achieving that end goal. So that would be my advice to the young folks. You know, these are great times. You have access to all the information in the world with the internet. If there's Google engine, you can research a lot of things on your own. Our times, we didn't have access to such information. There was what we call asymmetric information. <laughs> Somebody has to tell you to even know that there's a school out there called Harvard, right? Today, every, all information is out of your fingertips. So they really can actually carve a, a, a path to success if they put their minds to it. Mm -hmm. Very, very profound. Thank you very much, sir. I hope our students have been paying attention and especially to the advice. You need to, you need to be on your A game. You need to A game on to be successful, to increase your chances of success. Thank you so much, Dr. Bamfo. This was, this was quite Thank an interesting. I mean, I've never been an economist, but I was actually really interested in today's topic. And yeah, economics is, 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 a, is a subject, is a cause to reckon with. Um, Dr. Wilson, I don't know if you have any words. Yes, I do. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so first of all, I want to thank my neighbor. Um, you know, we're literally neighbors. And, you know, he's just a dynamic man. Um, in addition to everything he does at work, he spends time exercising. And he's also a very proud Green Springs father. And so I'm just very proud of him and the things he said and the detail that he went into 
explaining um, what it's like to be an economist. Now, I happen to be an economist also. I'm an engineer, but also I have a degree in economics. He mentioned a course called Econometrics. And if there's a course that kind of, to me, says what you're made of and what you can, can deal with, econometrics is that course. And so anyone who's an economist probably has taken econometrics. And so I appreciate what uh, Dr. Bamfo said about his math background and how without that, he probably would not be able to get through that course. So uh, Dr. Bamford, uh, Bampo, as someone who's gone through that course also, I say that we, you know, we made it through the rain and we find ourselves respected by those who got rained all, on also and made it through courses like <laughs> econometrics. You wanna talk just for a second about econometrics and just how, how tough a course it is, but what it prepares you for. Yeah. So um, thank you very much, Dr. Wilson, for the kind words. Um, econometrics uh, is very interesting, right? It's a combination of, you know, statistics, you know, where you're dealing with probabilities, um, there are elements of calculus in there. And I, I quite remember when I was introduced to econometrics in Ghana during my first degree, there, were, there was a lot of memorization, right? Because I, I felt like some of our teachers didn't have a full appreciation of it. You know, so I kind of sailed through and I went to do my master's in Canada and I had to use econometrics to do my first master's paper. And I realized that when it came to the application of econometrics, you know, whether to run regressions, which is a model, you know, where you are trying to look at how some variables impact on particular, um, you know, um, dependent variables and all that. I realized that I really didn't have a proper understand because I'd memorized it when I was in Ghana just to pass my exam. Now I needed to understand it to do my research and it was a big challenge. So I had to really sit down and try to better understand it. When I got to PhD and I did my dissertation and I was having my presentation, I had, I, I, I had a very fantastic presentation only for one of the professors to ask me a question about my model and the econometrics behind it. And my head started spinning, right? So I couldn't defend my um, dissertation that day. We needed to call it off because I really didn't really understand the question very well. That's what econometrics can do to you. It's a tool that is very important when it comes to economic research, you know, because it's all about modeling. You know, if you want to understand how some variables impact the, um, the economy, you know, how do you model it? And how can you use those regressions and use econometric tools to be able to come up with predictions and forecasts and what have you? So it's very, very important if you're gonna be a researcher, be it at the central bank, be at IMF, econometrics is gonna be critical because it's gonna be all about research, all right? And research is about modeling. And once you model, those models are then supposed to give some predictions or forecast as to what is gonna happen in the future so that we can make policy decisions about what is potentially gonna happen in the future. So econometrics is gonna be very critical if you're going to do economics at the higher level, be it masters or PhD. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, I just want to just uh, recognize the fact that you have your doctorate degree. And, you know, that uh, I know very few. I, as a matter of fact, I think you're the only person that I know who has a doctoral degree in economics. So it just says a lot about who you are and what you're able to accomplish. So well done. And uh, thank you for spending your Saturday with us. So, uh, again, thank you for all that you do. And, um, you know, I hope that you've encouraged uh, our students to go into the field of uh, economics. You know, it's uh, the economists understand what's happening and the economists make things happen. They, they make things make sense and they help leaders and industry to make decisions that, that really matter. And so um, I, I really wanna encourage everyone to consider this as a career and to follow in uh, Dr. Uh, Bampo's uh, footsteps and uh, just be the leader that you're called on to be. So again, thank you, sir.